Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here today, and I think you're in for a great treat here at INTED. So I have to begin by just giving you a, a little bit of a sense of what it's like for me in a typical February, March time frame when I'm going to work at my day job in Michigan. So here we go. Hi, yeah, I'm getting ready for work. And I teach this course called Learning How to Learn. It's a massive open online course, a MOOC. And my co-instructor in that is Terry Sanowski, who's the Francis Crick professor at the Salk Institute. And here's Terry going to work at his day job. So this is, gives you a little sense of some of the power of online learning is it helps not only students to get together from all over the world, but also faculty can, can meet together in a new forum to create intriguing new, new materials. So yeah, I'm just a, a little Midwestern professor, and I was shocked. I was invited to speak at Harvard. I was a nervous wreck. I mean, it's Harvard. <laughs> and I walked into the room, and I was even more nervous because the room was packed, standing room only. And I wondered, why are there so many people here? And it turns out, our one little course, made for less than $5,000, mostly in my basement, had on the order of the same number of students as all of Harvard's online and massive online courses put together, made for millions of dollars with hundreds of people. So what this tells you is that people are hungry for fresh approaches to learning, and they're starving to get really innovative new insights that can help them in their learning. So, uh, so I should back off just a little bit and give you a sense of where I'm coming from uh, as a human, just as Tony did earlier. So uh, here's just a little sense of me growing up. I, I grew up moving all over the United States. So by the time I hit about 15 years old, I'd lived in 10 different places. Now, normally, I mean, that can be a very good thing, except for one scholastic issue. And that is the fact that math is extraordinarily sequential. So if you fall off anywhere along the way, you're you can be lost. Well, when I was moving from Texas to Massachusetts, when I was about seven years old, they were suddenly way far ahead of me in the multiplication tables. Well, you might think, oh, well, she just caught right up, right? I mean, well, no, <laughs> I didn't catch right up. I, I'd never really cared for math in the first place. I just didn't think, you know, it was useful at all, and I certainly didn't think I had the math gene. And so when they were far ahead of me, I just thought, well, I just can't do this. And I ended up flunking my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science, which is kind of ironic since I'm standing here in front of you today as a professor of engineering, and I am the real deal. I mean, I've published in pop, top journals. I've, uh, I, I teach advanced uh, graduate level engineering courses. And so one day though, one day one of my students found out about my past as a sordid, horrible math flunky. And he asked me, how did you do it? How'd you change your brain? And I thought about it. I thought, how did I change my brain? Because I was just this little kid. And, and I like this picture because it is truly the last cute picture of me. <laughs> but, but I just, I loved animals, and I liked knitting and weaving and all those kinds of things. And I, I didn't know what I could possibly be when I grew up. I knew it couldn't be anything analytical. And especially at that time, the US, is, it's not like Europe. It's not like you're comfortable with other languages. I, 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 I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could learn another language? 
And so, wow, that, was, that became my passion. I became so excited about that. But there was no way to, you know, I couldn't afford to go to college, but I found out there was one way to learn a new language and actually get paid for it, and that was to join the Army. <laughs> So that's me looking really nervous about to throw a grenade. And if you knew how clumsy I actually am, you would know why I look so nervous. <laughs> but I, I did learn another language. I learned Russian, and I ended up working on Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea. And I just loved having new adventures and seeing the world through new perspectives. So I also ended up working at the South Pole Station in Antarctica, and, uh, and that's where I met my husband. So I always say I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that man. <laughs> but, but the thing is, uh, by the time I reached age 26, I found something that really surprised me. And that was, I had I'd done everything people had said. I'd followed my passion, done what I thought was really inside me, and I found out that I hadn't really been thinking about the world and its needs. And by that I mean, no recruiter was knocking on my door saying, oh, we've got to have your Slavic languages and literature skills. So I thought, oh, what, what can I... What can I do again? And I remembered when I worked with all these West Point engineers, I'd look at their textbooks, it looked something like this, these kind of wild equations, and I, I remember looking at them and thinking, that looks kind of like a, a foreign language. And then I began to realize, now wait a minute, aren't I supposed to be open to new adventures and learning new perspectives? Why don't I see if maybe I can change my brain, rewire myself, and learn in math and science? So at age 26, I did exactly that. I went back to the university, started at remedial high school algebra, and began to learn how to learn in this very, very different subject. But I found something interesting, that actually the commonalities of learning uh, in a language are very similar to learning in math and science. And it, in fact, if I had known, though, then what I know now about how you learn effectively, I could have made it so much easier on myself. So let's, let's talk about some of the fundamental ideas that are growing from neuroscience about how we learn and how we can change ourselves. So let's look at the, at the brain and one of the brain's fundamental sorts of um, uh, building blocks, and that is the neuron. Now, there's about 100 billion neurons in the brain, and I wish you could see yourselves. You, your, your, your faces are kind of going, oh gosh, this is where she's going to get to the really boring science stuff. So let's spice it up a little bit. We've got, we've, here's our analogy for a neuron. And you can see there's kind of that big lump over there, that's the nucleus. And then our space alien, uh, uh, which is the representative of our neuron, has legs on it. And those legs are called dendrites. And on the legs, there's all these little toes. I mean, it's a space alien. And in reality, those little toes are called dendritic spines. So then the neuron has almost like an arm that reaches out, and that arm is called an axon. And what neurons do is they reach out with their arms, and they tickle the toes of the next neuron. So that's what neurons do. That's their job. They, they reach out and communicate uh, and send a signal to the next neuron. Now, so here we can see how this signal is propagating along. It's more or less an electrical signal that moves along, and 
passes from one neuron to the next. It is a bit more complicated than that. We've got, here we've got neuron that's, the, the signal's coming along, it's actually then uh, sort of translated into neurotransmitters that come along and pass the signal along chemically. But I'm an electrical engineer, so I'll just call it an electrical signal, and that's pretty much good enough. So when you learn anything, what you're doing is you're creating sets of links between neurons. So for our purposes here, we've got something like five neurons together. And, uh, and we can think, I mean, it's actually probably more and sometimes many more, but let's say that you learn a chord of the guitar. You're making a set of connections between a certain number of neurons. Or you're learning how to conjugate a verb uh, in Ukrainian. Or you're trying to learn a dance step or how to take a derivative in math. So any of those things you're learning, you're creating a nice set of links. And as you practice with what you've learned, those connections build and strengthen. So, so you can almost think of it as a set of neural links, and the more you practice and use those sets of links, the stronger and, and thicker those links become. Now, what happens if you don't practice? So let's say you understood a concept when a professor was teaching it or a teacher was uh, providing it in class, and you wait for a couple of weeks. So you understood it at one time, then you wait before you review it. And then, two weeks later, you go to look at the actual uh, material, and suddenly, what you understood before doesn't seem to make sense at all. You can't understand it again. And what has happened in the meantime is your little sort of synaptic janitor has gone along and knocked off some of those neural connections so that uh, that's why you can't understand again what you had even understood before. So this is what is happening when you're learning is you have little, you, you, as you're learning, as you're learning something here even right now, a little dendritic spine is beginning to poke out from a dendrite. And then the real time when it emerges all the way is tonight, when you will go to sleep. So when you sleep, that's when those dendritic spines just pop out and make the connections and practice with those connections. So this is why it's so important for students to, to uh, practice and to get a good sleep. Here you can see a light microscopy image. This is an image of a neuron before learning and before sleep. And this is the same exact image or the same exact neuron after learning and after sleep. And if you look, where are those, these blue triangles? They are indicating new dendritic spines that have popped out and emerged uh, as a consequence of the fact you've learned something and then you've gone to sleep at night. So this is, uh, this is why it's so important to space out your learning, to have a little bit of practice all in several, over a number of days. If you have 10 hours of study and you do it all in one day, you don't have time for e each evening for those synaptic connections to grow, and your little synaptic janitor can more easily sweep those patterns away. This is why sometimes students who are very smart, and they get used to cramming, so they just procrastinate, then they cram at the very last minute, and then uh, it works for a while. But sometimes when they get to college, they get to uh, like the middle of a more difficult course, and suddenly they're struggling because they haven't laid a solid foundation. They haven't really learned how to do that. So uh, learning, you can kind of think through analogy. It's a little bit like building a brick wall. You want to lay a layer of bricks, lay them mortar, then more bricks, 
and let that mortar dry so it takes a little time as you're building the wall to height. If you don't do that, you'll have this sort of poor neural structure and it's not very good for learning. So it's almost, we can think of it a little bit like uh, by thinking about this weightlifter. We can look at this weightlifter and we know this guy did not sit there the night before the big meet and start to cram. <laughs> but because we can't see that something quite similar to muscular development is going on with neural development and neural structure, we often think, oh sure, it's all mush up there, you can just cram the night before, but that's actually not true. And speaking of this fantastic weightlifter, I do have to bring to mind uh, one of the latest um, sort of insights we have that's relevant to learning. We've often known that exercise can be a valuable uh, adjunct to, uh, to your learning. It helps enhance your ability to learn and remember. But we haven't known why. I mean, why would exercise? It's not much to do with your brain at all. But now we've found, like in the last year and a half, researchers have discovered part of the magic behind why exercise is so important. And it has to do with when you exercise, you put forth in your brain a factor called brain-derived neurotropic factor. And we can abbreviate that to BDNF. And BDNF, as it turns out, seems to allow neurons to more easily make connections. And we can actually see that in using light microscopy. Here's an image of a neuron before uh, BDNF is essentially sprinkled on this neuron. And here is in the, the same neuron after application of BDNF, look at all those little dendritic spines that have just erupted. Can you see it's a lot easier to make connections with these, neuro with these dendritic spines because they're just hanging around there waiting to get connected to something. So I, I, should, so I should switch uh, perspectives because there's so many different aspects of learning. Great learning is like baking a cake. It has so many different ingredients. And what I should talk about is the difference between working memory and long-term memory. So working memory is what you hold temporarily in mind. So maybe Google sends you a code, so 47325, so you repeat it to yourself, 47325 as you go and you enter it into uh, some other device. So you're holding it temporarily in working memory. And long-term memory is sort of where you store long-term information, um, how your mother's face looks, uh, the names of your friends, maybe even something you've learned in school. So where is, what's where in the brain? Where is working memory? Where is long-term memory? It turns out that working memory is sort of in the prefrontal cortex. So it's towards, mostly towards the front of your brain. And it's almost like it has these four arms, like an octopus that can, that can hold four different items, uh, pieces of information. So here we go, there's our working memory with the octopus and its four arms. And, and where is long-term memory? It's, mo it's more scattered throughout your brain, but for our purposes, we're going to imagine that it's just, it's in this locker or set of lockers, and within those lockers are a set of neural links. And you've created those neural links by practicing and learning uh, this material. So when you're learning something, your working memory is often working very, very hard. What it's trying to do is it's trying to create a set of links. And once it's got that set of links, then your attentional octopus can just 
reach out, it's like this subroutine, and it can grab it, pull it to mind, and then you can work a math problem, conjugate a verb, do, do whatever you want, not because you're thinking and holding it in, in mind, but because you've already analyzed it and you can just grab that set of links. So this brings me to my younger daughter, Rachel, and I needed someone, uh, if, if you're wondering why perhaps the, uh, the Massive Open Online Learning How to Learn course was made so inexpensively, it's because whenever I ha needed someone for a bit part, I would just ask our daughters, and they, they work cheap, they work for food. So, so, so uh, well, I remember one night at the dinner table, I said, I need to have someone modeling backing up a car really badly as when you're first learning how to back up a car. My younger daughter, Rachel, says, Mom, I got this. I can do this. <laughs> so here you see little Rachel modeling what it was like for her when not long before she had been learning how to back up a car. And you can see her little face is just, look, did, did she look at the side mirror, the back mirror, the front, the back, which, which way she turn? And then next thing you know, off she goes into the ditch. So, so what this is showing, when you're first learning to back up a car, your, your working memory is kind of going really a little crazy. It's got a heavy cognitive load, and you don't have any, arm, no working memory arms are left for anything else. But when you have learned how to back up the car, all you have to do is think, you know, I'm going to back up the car. And you pull that set of links to mind, and voila, you've got a light cognitive load. You've got arms that are available for other things, like what's that song on the radio, or is my seatbelt fastened? So the more you can help your students develop these sets of links that they can pull to mind, the better they can do in your course. Because, for example, when you hand a test to them, they, they, their working memory goes, oh yeah, you know, I've got this stuff. You're just asking me to connect this idea with this idea and maybe with this other idea and voila, you can make all those connections. So uh, I think the challenge for some students is because they don't know how their brain works, they'll, they, they, they've studied by just reading the material. They haven't actively worked with it, with their working memory, and put those sets of links into long-term memory. And then when you give them the test, they're trying to figure it out. And they think that's test anxiety. But actually, sometimes it's not. In fact, many times it's not. It's just that they haven't created those sets of links in long-term memory. So, uh, what we know is that experts of any kind are, are their one common factor is that they, they have lots and lots of sets of links. So uh, that's the common, common factor of, of uh, experts anywhere, in any subject, whether it's uh, playing chess, learning a musical instrument, learning a foreign language, learning in math and science, uh, something physical, whatever you're learning, you're creating those sets of links that make it easier for your long-term memory to work. Now, sometimes we think some of our best traits are really bad traits. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, in my classes, I'll be teaching, for example, probability and statistics for engineers, and I might ask a really difficult question. And one of my students, right in the front, arm right up, they've got the answer, they're good. And you can almost see the other students in the class say, you know, I'm, what's in it for me? I'm never going to be that kind of a fast thinker. And the reality is, it is true. Some people are really fast thinkers. It's like they have race car brains. But others, they are slower in how they think. 
They, they, they're like hikers. They can get to the finish line, but it takes them much longer to do that. But think about what the hiker sees. Race car brain, everything goes by in blur. Hiker brain, they can reach out, they can touch the leaves on the trees, they can smell the pine in the air, see the little paths. They have a completely different experience and in some ways much richer and deeper. My hero in science is a great Spaniard named Santiago Ramon y Cajal. And Cajal was a terrible student. He had a poor working memory, which actually gave him some advantages. But he was kicked out of school as a, you know, a problematic student time after time. And yet, he became what is known as the father of modern neuroscience, won the Nobel Prize. And Cajal was once asked, what was behind your success? And he said, well, um, I was persistent. Of course, we, we understand persistence would be a very a valuable thing. But he said, also, he said, I was flexible. And by this he meant, well, he said, I have worked with many geniuses, and I am no genius. And he wasn't. He, had, he really struggled in his learning, had a poor working memory. And, uh, but he said, the problem with geniuses is they're so smart, they grow up being right, and they don't get used to get, being wrong and to correcting their errors. And so what geniuses can do is they can become inflexible. They're used to thinking very quickly, solving everything very quickly, and when they're wrong, they can't change their mind. So they can jump to conclusions and, again, be inflexible about changing. So if you or your students are slower thinkers, rejoice, because sometimes you will be able to do what even geniuses cannot. So I thank you so much for your attention. It's a privilege to share.